So good afternoon also from my side. I'm Christoph Kams from the ECB's Monetary Policy De Department and, and thank you very much, Philip, for this excellent introduction. So I have the pleasure to share session one on monetary policy, credit and financial crisis. And uh, let me uh, congratulate the organizers of the conference for the perfect foresight they had to put a session like that on a day when the Nobel Prize in Economics was awarded to three outstanding economists for their work on the very theme of this session. Um, I would also like to thank them and everyone behind the scenes uh, for, for making this event uh, run smoothly. smoothly. So we are glad to have four uh, very distinguished speakers and discussants in the first session today. Let me briefly introduce um, our speakers for the, for the first session, who are well known, of course. So we're glad to have Thomas Philippon, who is a regular guest at ECB events and has spoken previously, for example, at our uh, Sintra Forum. He is Professor of Finance at New York University, and today he will present his recent work on the too big to fail uh, problem that, uh, as we all know, came front and center with the collapse of Lehman Brothers 14 years ago and has uh, preoccupied researchers uh, since then. We are also happy that Michaela Pagel has accepted to act as discussant uh, of Thomas' paper. So Michaela is Associate Professor of Finance at Columbia Business School. So I very much look forward uh, to Thomas' presentation and the discussion. Let me just give some housekeeping announcements. So the organizers have allocated 25 minutes for the presentations, 10 minutes for the discussion, and then we will have uh, 10 minutes for a question and answers, including also Thomas' reaction to Michaela's discussion. What I would uh, kindly ask the audience to do is to submit any questions for the Q&A via the WebEx chat function. Uh, the presenter will be able to see those, but I will then also read them out uh, so that uh, the entire audience uh, knows about the questions. So without further ado, uh, Thomas, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for organizing this conference and for uh, inviting our paper. This is John Walk with my colleague at NYU, uh, Olivier Wang. And uh, yeah, we'll try to propose a kind of a new uh, way to think about um, systemic risk and too big to fail, which is not as pessimistic as the, the usual uh, view. So um, the context of the paper is the uh, regulation of the financial system post uh, Lehman Brothers, post the global financial crisis. And broadly speaking, we've done three things. We've increased capital requirements, we've beefed up uh, supervision, and we, and we, make, uh, we try to make uh, progress on resolution. So uh, there's been lots of work. I was involved in the BIS review of all systemic risk uh, regulation that was published uh, uh, last year. And so my broad assessment is, I think in terms of capital requirements, uh, you could argue whether we went um, far enough in the sense that, you know, you, maybe you would choose 15% or 17 or 19 or 22. Um, and then there's some, it's not clear exactly which is the perfect number, but there is no doubt that we've made very significant progress. So broadly speaking, capital ratios are twice what they used to be before the crisis. And that's clearly uh, a success. Now, uh, for supervision, I think it's to some extent uh, quite similar. I think we've, we've improved a lot of supervision. Uh, and again, just like for capital requirements, you could argue we could do more. Nobody is thinking that it's perfect, but I think the broad assessment is that there's been very, very significant progress. The third uh, pillar, the resolution, is, is a lot more uncertain. It's a lot less clear, um, you know, whether we really made significant progress. And um, the reason is, is very deep. It's because, um, you know, you can improve the coordination of regulator. You can uh, um, you know, create single point of entry uh, resolution regime. You can work on cross-border resolution. Um, and then on all of these uh, points separately, there's been a lot of progress. But the very basic idea that, uh, the, the basic issue that's at the core of too big to fail um, is that no matter what you do, it's still gonna be essentially impossible to resolve all the banks at the same time during a systemic crisis. I think that is the fundamental tension. 
And, and there are even people who, like me, um, think that we've made actually very significant progress on the resolution. I think the living wheels are a very significant progress. Um, even people like me who are cautiously optimistic in that dimension, um, even these people remain to some extent skeptical that this fundamental tension that you know, no matter what happens, if there is a big crisis, you will not be able to resolve all the banks at the same time. I think that remains to some extent unaddressed. And so therefore, from this, um, from this line of reasoning came a somewhat pessimistic conclusion, which is, um, you know, we're still going to have to bail out the banks. Therefore, the expectations uh, of bailouts will remain and will continue to distort funding costs and, and feed more hazard. And um, so what's our paper going to do? Well, we're going to agree with the premise, which is, yes, this fundamental change remains. I think it is unlikely to ever be credible for any um, financial authority to commit to let many banks fail and be resolved at the same time. I think we agree with that premise. Okay? But we're going to disagree with the conclusion. We're going to argue that the conclusion comes from a very uh, limited set of, of contracts and, and, in fact, models that people have used. So the main point of the paper is that even if you are going to do a bailout, you can still get rid of more hazard. Okay, so we agree with the premise, but we're going to show you that the, the, the conclusion does not follow. So we're going to be able, in some cases, and of course, there is like tons of caveats in the paper. Uh, we're going to show that in the benchmark model, we can implement the first best allocation with time consistent policies. So to be clear, what that means is that if you end up in a situation where uh, it is exposed clearly Pareto efficient to do a bailout, because the alternative is a crisis, a meltdown of the system and a very big recession. So presented with this alternative, any sensible regulator or policymaker or central bank will always decide to save the system. So that's why we make time consistent. So you cannot commit to let the house burn. Um, even in this world, we're going to be able to implement the first best uh, allocation. And um, the reason is that we are going to step away from the one size fits all um, bailout. Okay, so in the model, we're going to have bailouts. And it turns out uh, they are exposed efficient in large crises. So exposed, you always want to implement some, some bailout to avoid, um, in very large crises, to avoid uh, a big recession. The banks are going to fully anticipate that. They're going to understand that uh, if they all go into trouble together, then um, a significant fraction of them will be bailed out. They fully understand that part. Uh, and yet we get the first best. So what's the trick? Well, we're not going to bail out all the banks in the same way. We're going to implement a tournament. Um, or it could be... An, the, the result is more general than that, but it could be uh, implemented as a tournament. And so that's the, main, that's the punchline of the paper. Now, it turns out that um, in, uh, in the process of doing that, um, we get interesting new definitions of systemic risk, uh, the difference between size and interconnections, the, the importance of substitutability and stuff like that. And so for those of you who are maybe less um, uh, researchers, uh, purely academic like me, but who followed more like the debate about how, how do you define too big to fail, for instance. You know, so if you look at the definitions, usually we say, well, it's not just size, it's interconnection, it's lack of substitution, and stuff like that. So that's kind of the theory of it. But then in practice, when you look at what's done, it's pretty much size only. Um, so I always thought that this debate was a, were a little bit like semantic. Yeah. At the end of the day, we just, we just mean size. Well, I changed my mind a little bit because in this model, I will have for a very precise reason, I will tell you why it does matter, uh, the degree of substitution and why interconnection uh, does matter, independent of size. But that only appears once you understand the, the key time consistency issue. So let's start with the baseline model. Um, so it's quite simple. You have two periods and you have a bunch of banks. So we are interested in too big to fail. So that means the number of banks n must be more than two or three, but less than 100. Right? So we don't have the law of jar number or anything like that. We have just a few large banks. Um, and the banks have assets and liabilities. <coughs> assets are standard. You have uh, the book value A and then return uh, Ri, which is random, which is a source of risk. On the liability side, um, we're going to just split between anything you could potentially bail out, uh, sorry, bail in, like so TLAC, and deposits. 
So it's a slightly different from the usual definition where you would separate equity and then maybe uh, debt, short or long or subordinated, and then deposit. We're going to lump all the things that you can potentially uh, bail in uh, as equivalent to equity EI here and all the deposit on the other side, and just for simplicity. And also to emphasize that we are not about, we, we don't really want to work on the issue of capital requirement. We want to say, given the balance sheet, what's the best way to act exposed? Um, there's going to be a capital shortfall if uh, the bank's uh, equity or TLAC falls below some, um, some threshold, which is proportional to asset value. So that's the, cl the classic thing. And then um, in the most of the paper, I'll show you how, um, I'll show you like a general welfare function. And um, with this assumption that the financial distress happens when E falls below uh, some, some threshold, uh, we provide some micro foundation using <laughs> exactly funnily enough, a diamond dipping model of runs and a model of fire cells to motivate uh, the key things, to show you that our results applies to a broad set of uh, environments. Okay, so what's the key issue of moral hazard? Uh, Bank I is gonna choose its safety investment XI. So XI is the key moral hazard variable, right? The bank chooses safety XI to maximize its expected value. But not, of course, taking into account the negative externalities uh, that distress in finance can pose to the rest of the economy. So formally, the returns that the bank is going to get is going to be most of the time, so in normal times, with probability P0, so think of P0 as like 0.95, you know, like 95% of the time you're in a normal state. In a normal state, um, you know, all safety investment is useless. So this is just a cost uh, for you. So F is decreasing and concave in X. Um, so all the things you do to prepare yourself against a crisis are a cost, and then when the crisis doesn't happen, it's, it's a waste. So if you only look at the good state of the world, then your incentive is to make X as low as possible. Um, the return of the bank in the normal state is just F of X decreasing, uh, plus some noise that we add for, uh, just for the sake of uh, completeness of contracts. In the crisis states, X becomes important. Okay, so with priority PS, you're going to be in a crisis state, and the number of states with a crisis could be any number you want. So it's indexed by the state, um, and you know state one is not as bad, and then the state big S is the the really bit the really bad one. And the key thing there is that um, if you choose a higher uh, level of safety X, then you're going to have a better outcome for the risk distribution. So formally, it's like first order stochastic dominance. If X uh, is higher then uh, your returns are gonna be uh, better in this crisis state. Okay, so this distribution function is increasing in the stochastic dominant sense in, in X. Um, all right, so that's it, that's, that's the bank, uh, that's the bank uh, uh, problem, okay? So they choose their safety and they understand returns are random um, and also they might get into uh, financial distress. Now, when they maximize, of course, they take into account their expected bailout. So M is a bailout from the from the government from the central bank and um, to be clear in again here we're going to assume that m takes the form of a cash transfer but uh, i've worked of course with these models many times and we show equivalence to equity injections uh, you know debt guarantees and things like that but here for simplicity imagine m, m is just a cash transfer that you use to increase the equity ratio of the bank so the bank know that uh, the banks anticipate the fact that they might get some transfer from the government um, now the tension, of course, is because the government has a welfare function that is different from uh, the sum of the value of the banks. So the, the welfare from the perspective of society is, the first part is, of course, the same. So the, that's where they agree with the banks. So the sum of the equity value of all the banks. Um, the debt is going to be fairly priced, so uh, the net value here doesn't show up. Um, and then the tension is, appears here. So there's going to be a, an externality function that says that if many banks are under distress, then there will be a negative externality on the rest of the economy. And that's where I'm using this uh, welfare function V, um, because to show you that the model is quite general, and we provide micro foundation for V in the appendix. So if the banks are under distress, then the, there will be a loss for, for the government or for society. So the government would like them to intervene by beefing up the equity of the banks. That's this M transfers. But of course, there's a fiscal cost, and the fiscal cost depends on the aggregate bailout M, which is the sum of the little M's. 
And we index it with um, a parameter gamma, which captures the, fun the funding cost for the government so that we can compare, say, what a government like the US would do to what a government like the Greek government would do. So Greece would have a high gamma, so a high cost of funds, so may not be able to do a large M. Okay, then the first best allocation here is just to maximize with respect to X and M uh, this welfare function. Okay, and just to be clear, this is the first best in the sense that this is assuming that the government would choose the level of safety uh, for the banks themselves. Okay, so this is assuming a way more hazard. So that's not realistic. It's not, it's, it's the first best benchmark so we can compare later. Okay, you just simplify that. You just uh, uh, maximize welfare subject to all the constraints. Um, and then you, that's how it defines uh, the first best. So to make progress, it's useful to actually specialize this uh, value function here. So um, in most of the, uh, in, in the benchmark model, we use the one in the paper with uh, VR and code that we did on systemic risk. And that's a, a welfare function that says that really the, the cost of financial crisis comes from the fact that the entire system is undercapitalized. So we don't really care which bank it is, and we don't care uh, the specific allocation of capital shortfall across banks. What matters is the aggregate capital shortfall for the entire banking system taken as a whole. So in that case, uh, the welfare loss or the, the, the key metric is equity of the total system, so total equity of the bank plus total bailout minus total capital requirements, okay, aggregated across all banks. Um, okay, so in this uh, simple model, we can compute the ex post optimal uh, aggregate bailout, okay, um, and it's just going to be the race between the cost of fund for the government and uh, the value of beefing up the equity for the banks. And in this simple case, you can show that something which is pretty intuitive. Um, you know, there's, the, there's going to be no bailout, so M equals zero if the crisis is moderate. And then if the crisis becomes large enough that you get into the big systemic risk region, then you start uh, to provide a bailout. Um, this, the shape of the bailout depends a little bit on your uh, cost function. So if you take a country, let's say like the US, where this cost function is uh, linear, so gamma prime is constant, then the government can pretty much, you know, increase its level of bailouts without affecting its cost of fund. Then the, the first, the, the best thing you can do is to provide a safety floor. So you say, you know, if the losses are moderate, you, uh, the banks should bear the losses, but there will be a threshold, there will be an excess level of losses that we will not tolerate. So you put a floor on the equity. So formally, uh, the total bank return plus the money from the government is going to be stabilized at some lower uh, N0. Um, of course, that's only if you have a constant cost of fund. If instead you have a very steep um, marginal cost of fund, so when you start bailing out the rest of the market thinks the government might not be solvent and the cost of fund goes up, so that would be more relevant for say a country like Greece, then you provide a partial bailout to partially stabilize the system. Okay. So just to show you that we get exactly like very simple and intuitive predictions. Okay. So in the, the welfare loss function that we have, again, is very simple, which is if, if the aggregate bank capitalization is, uh, is negative or is below what it should be. So if the return is such that post transfer, you're below some kind of cutoff, then there is an externality that kicks in. Okay. Um, and then the optimal M is to and provide a bailout of that, that shape. Okay. All right, so that's kind of the, the, the baseline framework. Now, this is the framework people have used. We, we discussed many papers uh, in, in, the, in the literature review. This is pretty much a framework that many, many people have used to think about more hazard. Because obviously the banks anticipate that they will be bailed out. And so they know that they don't need to insure themselves very much against these really bad states because in these bad states, they will be bailed out, at least to some extent. So that's the fundamental reason why there is more hazard. And we show that in our uh, benchmark model, we get exactly the same result. But the thing that's important here is the qualifier. In all equilibria with symmetric bailouts, okay? Well, as it turns out, the, the literature has always assumed symmetric bailout, which is why they get uh, their results. And we're gonna break that assumption and show you that everything changes. So formally, we get all the standard results, okay? So first, strategic complementarities, that's kind of intuitive. So if the other banks in the system misbehave, 
your incentive to misbehave goes up. Why? Well, because if they don't invest in safety, then a big crisis is more likely. In a big crisis, everybody is going to get a transfer from the government, so your own incentives uh, to be safe go down. Okay, so this, like, this is more hazard at the bank level, but also more hazard in teams. Um, second point, there is more systemic risk uh, than without the government. Okay, so why is that? Well, because of the anticipation of the bailout makes the banks less safe, and because of that, it's going to reduce the investment in the end. We're going to have more systemic decrease than if you just completely shut down the government. And third prediction, which is also the one that people have emphasized, is um, the deeper the pocket of the government exposed, the bigger is the moral hazard. Again, intuitive. So if gamma decreases, the cost of fund of the government decreases, there will be the government will do more bailout exposed. Therefore, there's going to create more and more hazard ex ante. Okay. So in that, in that system, if you believe that's the right model of the world, immediate prediction is you want to bind the hands of the regulator. Okay, you want to decrease the, the degree of discretion as much as possible because if they have discretion exposed and if they have money um, to, to spend, they will do too much bailout that will discord and create too much more hazard. So this line of reasoning calls for uh, very uh, strong restrictions to limit the discretion of the regulators. And I'm going to show you that none of that actually follows from the model. All of that follows from the assumption of symmetric bailouts. So let's do tournament. No, no, just to be clear, I'm taking exactly the same model that everybody has used. I'm not changing anything to the underlying structure of the economy. All I'm doing is I'm saying you don't have to do the same bailouts for everyone. So let's do with two banks. So we're going to say the following. Uh, we're going to do, so first of all, we're going to be, um, exposed efficient so time consistent okay the, go the government is not contemplating the idea of letting the house burn at all it's very clear to everyone that no matter what happens we will save the system but we don't have to save it in uh, and save everybody at the same time so formally here we give a bonus delta to whichever banks happens to do better in the crisis okay. it, it could be that they both do quite poorly but one of them is likely to do better than the other okay in case of a tie we just break it uh, by randomizing. Um, okay, but exposed, even in a crisis where the average bank does poorly, some banks are going to do slightly better and some are going to do worse. Okay, so this is saying a bank that does better is going to get a bonus. A bank that does worse is going to get the opposite. Okay, so you can think of the previous model and therefore the previous literature as assuming delta must be zero. And here we're just relaxing that. So with two banks, that it's easy to show that so with n equal two banks, there exists a unique delta star, so wedge between the good and bad performing banks that would implement the social optimum. And that is um, not only, of course, exposed, it's efficient, but that's like by construction because I'm forcing my government to do the exposed uh, efficient thing. Okay, that's the root of time consistency. So I will do X star total bailout exposed. Uh, sorry, I will do M star exposed. I will do the optimal exposed bailout M, which depends on the on the uh, state of the world. But more importantly, I will get the right safety investment by the banks ex ante. In fact, I will get exactly the first best safety investment. Okay. Um, so this is just for two banks. You can do the same with any number of banks. In fact, it's, if anything, it's slightly easier because you have a finer grid when you have many banks. Um, and then you just this, you just decide whether you're above or below the median. And uh, you cannot you can do it with um, banks that have different sizes. Okay, so here we assume the banks are the same size to make the, the world simple. Uh, you can do uh, a distribution of bank size, and it works. Of course, as long as it's not too asymmetric. Okay, if you only have one extremely large bank that has 99% of the system and everybody else has one person, then de facto you're in a one bank world, and that doesn't work. Um, but in the benchmark model, just freeing up this uh, delta degrees of freedom is enough to bring you back uh, to the uh, to first best and no more hazard. Okay. So how come? Well, remember that um, we are constrained exposed to do an efficient uh, transfer. So that means that the total size of the bailout is fixed because it, it, it's the one that stabilizes the economy. Um, condition on the cost for the taxpayer. So on average, each bank is going to get half of it in this example. 
But you don't, it doesn't say you have to give half to everybody. So what we are doing is we are giving half plus a bonus to the to bank that does well in the crisis and half minus a bonus, minus or with a minus to the one that does poorly. Now, what does that mean for the banks? Well, it means that you have an incentive, you as a bank, to be sure that you're not the worst performing one in the crisis. Okay. So you look at the other bank, you think if we both go into trouble, um, one of us is going to be saved. Um, and with a bonus, the one is going to be punished. I don't want to be the one who ends up being last in the crisis. Okay, so that's going to increase my incentive to be a bit safer. So I can doesn't that does not necessarily push me to towards the first best. It just says that I should be I try to be a bit safer than my neighbor because if I'm a bit safer than my neighbor, I will get the bonus. But of course, the neighbor is not stupid. They understand that they do exactly the same, and that creates a race to the top where if you calibrate delta properly, you get at the first best level of safety. Um, so this is just one example, but in the interest of time, since we have a discussion, maybe um, uh, maybe I will skip that part and we can leave it uh, uh, for the discussion. Okay, um, so in the remaining uh, five or 10 minutes, I just wanna give you some, some caveats because of course, you know, like this is, there is still a bit of simplification in that model. So I want to show you the caveat in terms of what are the critical assumptions and, uh, you know, when is it that all results hold or when is it that it holds only approximately. So first issue, of course, limited punishment. All right, so if you go back to that figure here, uh, the problem is that if you take, uh, if you take a malus away from a bank, it could be the case that you, on net, end up uh, taking away money from the bank in a crisis state. And maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe we're going to say that, uh, well, the worst you can do is not give anything to a bank, but it's not credible to say that you're going to take away some of their, um, some of their funding. Um, so if, what happens if you have uh, limited punishment? So the transfer has to be weakly positive. So of course that decreases the set of equilibrium that you, you can implement. Um, but what's super interesting here is that um, it totally reverses. Let me go back to this. Remember this prediction of the standard model number three here, that more hazard is worse when the government has more fund. That actually is flipped. Okay. And that's flipped even if it was limited punishment. So formally, uh, the maximum implementable safety is decreasing in the cost of public fund. Okay. So if you have more public fund exposed, you can implement more safety, okay, which is the opposite of the uh, more hazard result. And why is that? Well, because you have more money to play with exposed, and so you're less constrained by the limited uh, punishment uh, constraint, which is that M must be positive. And therefore, you have more, actually, you have more rather than less ways to create the right incentive. Okay. So essentially, if the government is rich exposed, then the government will be able to save at least five banks. Okay? Imagine you have a war with seven banks. If the government is rich enough exposed, you know that it will be able to save five out of seven. Okay? Well, you really want to be one of these five then. Okay? Um, and so the fact that the government has this fiscal slack exposed actually is good for incentive, provided that you uh, use this tournament approach. Um, so in fact, here we have a complementarity between fiscal capacity and incentives. And by the way, I think that's also important because in the real world, um, I don't think the, the, the other prediction, I don't think holds. Like we don't necessarily see more moral hazard in countries that have uh, more fiscal slack, okay? And it's not because uh, they, they don't do any bailout, it's because they spread the bailouts better. Um, another thing that comes immediately from, from this limited uh, punishment is that if you hit the constraint that uh, M must be positive, then it gives you a rational to try to increase the punishment beyond that. And so any kind of clawback um, would actually be useful in that, in that world. Okay? So clawback causes on comp compensation. What's interesting here is that they become systematically important, not because you care about the nitty gritty of compensation. The bank, the central bank in the regard, they, they don't give a damn about that. But they understand that if it limits the, the incentives exposed, then clawbacks are useful because they relax the limited punishment constraint. So that uh, first thing I want to emphasize. Second is differentiated bank. And what's interesting here is that this notion of substitution uh, kicks in uh, relatively uh, naturally. So 
the key of the uh, welfare function that uh, comes from the paper I wrote with Viral and, and Matt and Lass on, Lass on uh, systemic risk was this idea that what really matters is the aggregate health of the banking system. Now, I think it's a very natural assumption, but hidden behind is a quite strong assumption, which is perfect stability across banks. Okay. That's what gives the tournament so much power because the size of the bailout is fixed by efficiency exposed. But if the banks are perfect substitute, you have almost infinite uh, leeway in allocating the funds across banks. Okay? And that does not alter efficiency because we assume that what matters is the total equity in the banking system. So ex post, $1 of equity is a perfect substitute across all banks. Now, is that a good assumption or not? I think it depends on the model, of course. It depends on the application. But you could imagine a world in which the banks are localized. Either they are localized in terms of the product space, so they do, they do sometimes have activities where they are the only one, or they are localized in terms of geography. They serve, uh, or demographics of firms or, or households. They serve a couple of, uh, a pool of customers that are only served by this bank. So in this case, you, there, are, there is a sense in which you would like to spread a bit across all the banks. It would be costly to just kill some of them. Okay. So that breaks the perfect substitution. Um, yeah. Next one, two minutes, please. Two minutes? Okay, perfect. Um, and so what happened in this case? Well, many things happen in this case, but, um, um, you know, so the first of all is we get, you know, the, the benchmark result that, uh, you know, you, you can still um, implement useful policies. Yes, it's true. And it's limited by the degree of substitution. So in fact, they we define a slightly different version of uh, Epsilon commitment, so when the planner can commit a tiny bit just to get the continuity, and we can show that you can implement degrees of safety, and the upper bound is given by the, the substitution elasticity across banks. Okay, so if you're worried about more hazard, then that means that this comes and this constraint is binding, then you have a strong incentive to increase the degree of substitution. That means what? That means making sure that at least two banks are active in each of the markets you care about. Um, so it's rational for redundancy regulation of uh, low substitution activities, and it gives you a rational for if you really can't do it, then that's when you hit the limit and you should use a, a more like a utility approach to regulation. Um, two minutes. So I think let me discuss maybe two things. Oh, we can also go back to um, uh, to that in the discussion, but I just want to flag a few things. So we, we have a discussion in the paper about, you know, can we reinterpret what happened in 2009 in the light of the model? Can we say which part of the bailout slash crisis response look like efficient from the perspective of the model, which ones do not? And um, yeah, we can. And, and, and it turns out that I think it's pretty, uh, it's pretty um, insightful. The one thing I want to emphasize is, the, of course, what happened in 2009 was not what the model was saying. The key, the key thing in the model is everybody understand ex ante that these are the rules of the game. Okay. And so if you want to think in your mind, what is the telltale sign that this is correctly implemented? Well, the day the government decides to let, imagine there are 10 banks, the day the government decides to let two banks fail, the stock price of all the other banks should go up. Okay? If that happens, then you are in the equilibrium we are describing. Because everybody understands that for incentive reason, you had to kill two. You're going to kill the two that performed the best, signaling that price that didn't do the right thing. The other eight are going to be safe for systematic uh, for systemic reason. So you kill two for more hazard, you save eight for systemic reason. So as soon as you announce which ones are the ones that are going to fail, the other eight are revealed to be in the safe camp. Their price should go up. Okay. Of course, that's not what we saw in 09. And the reason is because the game was not uh, explained properly. It was not even played properly by, by the government. So the, but that's our view of the world. And I think you know. I think you've heard everything. So let in interest of time, let me stop here and let. Uh, give the floor to Michela. Okay. Thank you very much, Thomas, for this inspiring talk. Uh, then we move to Michela's discussion. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Um, you can uh, upload your slides. Thank you so much for asking me to discuss the paper, let the worst one fail a credible solution to the too big to fail conundrum. This was a very interesting paper. I really enjoyed reading it. And the basic premise uh, Thomas explained really well in this paper is the idea that in principle, 
when the government ends up um, bailing out the bad banks, then they end up taking more risk ex ante. So we have this moral hazard problem. And now to mind, um, uh, it's Kursa's idea, Olivia's idea, was to basically not bail out all banks or all banks that failed, but instead to have a rule to um, reward good bank behavior and punish bad bank behavior. And if I can credibly commit to that rule ex ante, then the banks are incentivized to behave well instead of badly, and that may overcome the moral hazard problem. So this is the idea in the paper. And um, I thought about it for a little while. I really liked the idea. And I thought I focused my discussion on sort of discussing why this may not work so to say, in, in the real world. And there are three things that I think matter and that we have to think about um, for the feasibility of, of this rule to be implemented and followed through. And the first one, and Toma mentioned that in his last slide, is this idea that good banks may say no. And that is just right because they uh, do not want to um, take donations from the government if they don't need to. But we need to commit to that sort of rule in order to change the bank's behavior ex ante. So it's essential for us that the good banks take the money and get rewarded for the good behavior. And there's one thing which is stigma, but then there's other things that is just if I force a, a bank to take a loan, it basically also just reduces their their PL, if you if you will. So there's something beyond stigma. And then I wanted to think a little bit about this idea that it is not the bank is not one entity um, that or it's not the CEO that is making all the decisions, but ultimately the people that are taking too much risk are individuals within the bank. And there may be agency problems within the bank that I think we have to think a little bit about. And then the final point is sort of this idea that any policy needs to be agreeable enough for the people that live in the country. So, and here I want to, you know, think a little bit about how we would sell this to the people. OK, let me just, um, uh, there was a, the, the paper fits into a literature on the moral hazard too big to fail. I'm not going to spend too much time here, um, but uh, the paper is um, really well written and has a nice literature review. The model right, is pretty simple. It's two periods, two banks, and then the government commits to a policy rule in period zero. And then banks can choose to do the right thing. And this is called X in the model. It's an X anti-safe investment. And so X has the feature of decreasing bank return in normal times, but increasing their returns in crisis times. So X is a bad thing to do, so to say, in normal times, but it's a good thing to do in crisis times. And then there's like an idiosyncratic bank shock and an aggregate shock. Uh, we can either be in normal times or crisis time. And then in period two, banks survive, fail, or, or are bailed out. And so in principle, increasing X, the good thing, the X anti-safe investment is um, not in the bank's interest because it is basically helping them in crisis times, but in crisis times, they may be bailed out. So what's the point? Um, and now what we do is we basically have a government rule that rewards um, doing more of X which is the good thing. Um, so, and this basically just overcomes the morally hazardous incentive to lower X, X ante. So this is how the, the model works. And now I just wanna kind of comment on what, what I think are the next steps to think about um, why we may not be able to implement this in, in the real world. So, and the first point, and, um, Tuma mentioned that is that good banks may not want to be forced to take a loan when they are healthy. And, and here you can think a little bit about JP Morgan was a healthy bank after the 2008 financial crisis and they were forced to buy uh, Bear Stearns. Or, you know, the same happened with Bank of America. So banks may not want to do that because it is there's some stigma associated with this that Thomas mentioned, but then also simply because it lowers their PL. 
right? If I like add an asset um, um, to my balance sheet that is not as good as the other assets I hold, then um, this makes my balance sheet look worse. So, and the problem is that the moment that the good banks say no to the money, we end up again only bailing out the bad banks so the whole system breaks down. And now I want to think a little bit about um, ultimately who decides all of this, like who's the one um, taking money from the government and then also who are the people that are inside the bank that are taking too much risk. And I want to think about this in the context of what's currently happening with Credit Suisse. So there was a lot of attention um, to Credit Suisse balance sheet these days, right? Forbes is titling as Credit Suisse going bust. People are talking about Credit Suisse being the new Lehman Brothers. Um, what happened to in Credit Suisse um, basically is that there was this like family office hedge fund, uh, Arcadis, and uh, Arcadis making, was making a big bet and Credit Suisse was providing, was their prime broker and providing the, a lot of leverage to this hedge fund because Credit Suisse, the people that were making those decisions were profiting from Arcadis endeavors, right? Because they get the margin interest, they get the fees. So they are getting big bonuses because of the deals that they were making. And now what happened basically is that the uh, credit, the, they had massive losses, right? That is then when people start paying attention, when um, I think when things are going well uh, and people are making a lot of money, then I guess it's easy to close an eye on what's actually happening. But the moment that then there are massive losses, that is when uh, everybody's like paying attention, of course. So now what happened is, and I want to point this out, I just read this somewhere that you know, some people, some bankers are now resigning. Um, so this person resigned to join HSBC. Um, and then there's, so this article is basically talking about, okay, bankers have now the option to maybe leave before things go bust, right? Or they wait until their year end bonuses. And this is what people inside the bank think about, right? They think about their, their horizon is basically until December when they get their bonuses. So, and this is, I think, the problem that we have to think a little bit more about, that the bank is not an entity um, deciding what they do or don't do, but rather they are the people within the banks that are taking the risk, right? That is the risk manager, the prime broker unit at Credit Suisse, and the risk management unit that let um, Arcadis make the bets, and then only when they had massive losses, um, people were paying attention to it. So the individuals within the bank are making decisions and their incentives may not be the same as the ones of the CEO or the bank's shareholders. So uh, in fact, the prime broker team at Credit Suisse or the risk management team, they were sort of you know, profiting and what they, con what they are concerned about are their year end bonuses. Um, and you know, now like things went bust, so um, you know, they got fired, but then they just may move on to the next bank, HSBC, which then right, might be the next Credit Suisse. And who were they coming from? I don't know, maybe they came from Lehman, from Lehman Brothers. It's like pure speculation at this point. Um, so this is uh, the first main comment, I think, that we have to think a little bit about when uh, that the incentives for the whole bank are not the same as the people within the bank. And then the second bank, and this is nicely summarized in this um, graph, trust me, I'm a banker. Um, so, you know, ultimately we also, when we implement policies, we have to think about how they are perceived by the people. And um, the question is whether we could convince the public that rewarding good banks is the right thing to do um, or having this uh, government policy rule. And I just want to cite a few statistics that I came across so 77% of Americans believe that bankers would harm consumers if uh, they thought they would they could make a lot of money doing so. 65% uh, say that any bank and financial institution should be allowed to fail. 64% uh, think Wall Street bankers get paid a huge amount of money for essentially tricking people. And 72% of Americans uh, don't believe that new regulations on Wall Street think dot frank. Um, uh, are actually helpful in preventing future financial crises. So we also have to think a little bit about how the policy rule um, 
so to say, can be sold to people to make them agree to the the plan. So these are these are my my three main comments. So I really enjoyed reading the paper. I think it's a very interesting um, new perspective. It's a very interesting theoretical twist that allows us to uh, get around the bank bailout moral hazard problem. I think it's a very timely topic, given that Credit Suisse may be the next Lehman Brothers. Um, and um, I think there are three things that we need to think about. One is the uh, good banks have to say yes to this. The second one is the banks are made of people that take on that take risks and follow incentives. And then the people, the public, I mean, uh, need to be on board with the central bank policies. So that is one other thing, like how can we add this to the public? And I'm going to stop right here. Thank you so much for. Thank you very much, Michaela, for this very interesting discussion. Um, as I said earlier, uh, also the audience is invited to submit questions via the Q&A button uh, in the WebEx. Uh, I would invite you to do so. We can take a couple of questions, but maybe in the meantime, uh, I would uh, ask Thomas if you would like to immediately react to uh, Michaela's discussion. Yeah, well, so for, first of all, uh, Michaela, thank you very much for the, for the discussion. Um, and I'm going to take our three points in reverse order. So the third one is, um, is it politically feasible to help the good banks in bad times? I agree. To me, that's the, that's the most tricky question uh, because you need to convince the public that, uh, you are not, that you are not helping all the banks in a way which is not discriminate and that somehow the, the ones you are helping deserve it. And I agree that's a tricky question. I think it depends on the credibility and how you explain what you're doing. Um, but to me, that's, the, that's probably the part that I find the most uh, difficult. Um, agency inside banks, yeah, I agree. Though it, it, could, it, it could work both ways. I mean, it's like, um, I think it's important to take into account the agency inside the banks, whether it makes it easier or worse to implement exposed, I think that depends a lot on the model. In fact, you, in some of these cases, I, I would argue you could find that some of the employees could have been natural allies of the regulators. Uh, not even uh, the whistle, the whistle blowing is one dimension of it, but the other, like the, the incentive of the CEO might be much more on the, on the uh, loading on systemic risk side than the, what the employees would prefer. So um, I think that, um, I think we do, we should take into account the agency inside banks, but I'm not sure it would actually make our job uh, harder in this case. And on the first one, uh, on the fact that the good banks may not take the money. So that I think is very important. I think on that one, we do have, uh, a, complete solution. So the first point is that, remember, the reason why we have the stigma in everything is because most of the government interventions were, were constructed under the view that you're helping the banks that are in trouble. Okay? But in my world, it's the opposite. And the second thing is, and that gives me the chance to mention one thing I did not during the talk for lack of time, which is we do a lot of the implementation of the incentive using acquisitions. And there is one thing that's for sure is the banks never refuse loans and asset guarantees to make an acquisition. So, you know, JP Morgan didn't want the equity injection from the government, but they were very happy to get the subsidy loans and very happy to get the subsidies to take over Verstone in the form of guarantees on the, on the asset side of what they were buying. So the banks never refuse the asset guarantees. They really love it, even the good ones. And of course it makes sense because they are, it has the right shape for them, for, for their point incentive. And so in, in, if you think about the acquisition game, what we're saying is suppose you, again, suppose you have your four banks and then exposed two are kind of mediocre. One is doing very poorly. One is doing relatively well in the crisis. What can you do? Well, what you can do is you make the best performing bank acquire the worst performing bank. Okay. And then the more punitive the terms of this acquisition, the better it is. It's, it's a double win because if the terms are punitive, then that means the bank performing badly is going to be punished. That's exactly what we want for more hazard exempting. If the terms are punitive for the bad bank, by definition, they are attractive for the good bank. If, and, and by the way, that's the point where if they are not attractive enough, the government can provide an asset uh, guarantee, for instance, to make it even more attractive for the good bank. And the key is that does not create more hazard because you only do that for the bank that performs well exposed. So in fact, in that case, this acquisition solve all the problem and reduces more hazard. So one of the things we discuss is the fact that the one place where I would be happy to have the, the regulators have a bit more discretion of power 
is you know, to inflict terms that are pretty punitive to the shareholders of failing banks. Okay, I think that's good also uh, against small hazard. And on that one, I'm, I have no doubt that the good banks would be very happy to get the subsidy. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one question from the floor from Carlo Altavilla. Let me read it for everyone. I, I hope Thomas can see it on the screen. So the question is, do I understand correctly that the distribution of bank bailouts matters for shaping incentives, whereas the government cares only about the aggregate capital of the banking sector? And if yes, what happens if this assumption is relaxed? And also, when calibrating the price, does the government know the distribution of shocks? And then maybe let me take a second question, which came just from Oreste Cestani. A major concern with letting a big bank fail is contagion. Can you elaborate on the model? Yeah, great questions. So, uh, yeah, we discussed the, we discussed the um, information requirement uh, for the government. So it's not as bad because I, essentially what the government does expose is relative performance evaluation. And that turns out to be a lot more predictable than, so like we know in the data, it's very hard to predict a systemic crisis in the aggregate. But predicting who's gonna do relatively better is a, is a lot easier actually. Um, and so that's something we show in the paper with Viral, Lasse and Matt. So, and the key for the government, in our, the key for incentive in our world is the relative performance evaluation, which is the part which is a bit less, um, uh, expensive in terms of uh, information costs. Um, but otherwise, yeah, in the, so the, the response to the first question is yes, the benchmark model assumes that the government cares about the, the aggregate distribution and then um, but there's a distribution across, across banks. Again, imagine, the, uh, to go back to my, suppose you have four banks and exposed two are okay, but mediocre. One is doing very poorly, one is doing great. Um, so I'm gonna take the, 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 the best performing one and I'm gonna make it acquire the the list, the, the one doing poorly. And I don't care that the first one disappears. I don't care that it's being acquired by the first bank because I'm assuming that the activities of these banks are quite substitute, okay? So that's the key assumption. You could imagine cases where that would be a stretch, okay? If the bank that is being acquired does something very unique that is hard to transfer to another bank, that would limit this activity, okay? So this, this is the key, that, that's where you hit the constraint about the substitution of activities. Um, the contagion, uh, well, so again, so contagion depends on many factors, okay? In, in the key in our model is that you explain that the, the game you're playing, if the, if the market understands what the government is doing, the key, the key prediction is as soon as you announce that these are the banks that are not going to be supported or punished, and these are the ones that are going to be supported, the, when you fail the first bank, the first the stock price of the other one goes up, not down. Okay, so that's the key difference with contagion because the market never thinks, oh, this is the beginning of failing all of them. This is no, this is oh, the government has, has looked at the data and this and figured out which ones are uh, the worst performing. It's going to deal with these ones, and by definition, I mean the flip side of it is all the other ones are going to be safe. So in that sense, it does not. It's anti-contagion. Now, one caveat here is the timing. And so, of course, in the real world, uh, it's not two period. Prices take, oh, take a bit of time. And so the, the risk is more before, when you know there's something going, that's, that's going wrong, but you don't know exactly who is more exposed. That's the tricky part. Yeah. But that would be true in any model. That's not particular to us. OK, okay. so thank you very much uh, again to Thomas and, and to Michaela for the excellent uh, speech and, and discussion.